told us a lot about climate modeling in general, and you've alluded to some of your work in paleoclimate modeling, and I wondered if you could perhaps tell us a little bit more about some of the differences between modeling ancient climates and modern climate. Sure. Um, well, you actually use the same physical model, which is um, a good thing. You want to use exactly the same physics in the model, just the, the general circulation model, um, as works for the present and just shift that and apply that to the past. But to do that, the main thing you have to do is to change the boundary conditions. And that means uh, the layouts of the continents of, as they've varied some very, very much if you go far back uh, due to plate tectonics. Um, the amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which can be four times, eight times or more um, if you go back to the Cretaceous, say, uh, 100 million years ago. Um, then if you're interested in orbits uh, and or Milankovitch orbital perturbations over the ice ages, for instance, you set different um, orbital parameters, the eccentricity, precession, and obliquity of the Earth around the Sun. So there's a, a handful of those things, about four or five th uh, changes to the external boundary conditions that you impose on the GCM, and then you simply run it just like you would for the present, except you're simulating the climate um, 100 million years ago, say. So do these paleoclimate simulations have any relevance to the future and to society's uh, concerns? And I think the answer is definitely yes. Uh, we're about to enter in the next few centuries to millennia, so unprecedented increases in greenhouse gases, which are going to warm the climate tremendously. Now, we can attempt to just model that with uh, models based on the present day, but if we can go back in the past to when greenhouse gases were uh, the same levels as we anticipate, two to three to four times what they are today, that gives us an analogy and just a means of comp testing the models to see if they're doing the right job for the past, and then we'll have more confidence for them in the future. And the, for instance, the last time that greenhouse gases were three to four times present day amounts were, it was uh, in the e about before about 40 million years ago, 100 million to 40 million years ago. That's, you know, uh, and we can simulate those, those conditions uh, and compare with paleoclimate data that we have for those periods and see if the models are doing a reasonable job. Another example is, um, concerns parts of the present-day ice sheets, for instance, West Antarctica and also Greenland. And uh, it's quite hard to model those with coupled ice sheet and climate models to see how if, the, if they're vulnerable, if they're in danger of totally disintegrating, for instance, in the case of West Antarctica in the next mil thousand years um, due to increases in ocean and air temperatures caused by humans. But we can look in the past to see if those parts of the ice sheets have collapsed or not, and when they have, what were the climates um, that caused that, and try to simulate those with our coupled models. Another good, great thing about these models is helping to communicate to the public uh, the, what's really going to happen. Um, the the three-dimensionality of them means that you can make nice graphics and animation and also run them in, uh, forward in time to produce movies. And that sort of visual um, has a lot, big impact and potency for the public to s really see what might happen. For instance, we can run these ice sheet models and watch the ice sheets coming and going over tens of thousands of years and through, through ice age cycles, and uh, also how they might recede in the future. And, and so that's a, a great way of sh communicating to the public, much better than dry tables and uh, you know, thousands of just figures you might think. Well, this is great. Let's have a look at some examples of your work. Okay. This shows uh, work I've done coupling global climate models with ice sheet models. And it, it's for this particular experiment was, to sh um, uh, was aimed at the last glacial maximum 21,000 years ago really recently, geologic time, 
when ice sheets covered a lot of the northern hemispheric continents, all of, almost all of Canada, with, with kilometers thick ice sheets. And it's a real mystery why they came and why they went away again um, over very short geologic time periods. <coughs> and the purpose of, of this experiment was, experiment was just to see if the global climate model could produce uh, reasonable snowfall and snowmelt patterns over these ice sheets. And that's what you, ha you need to do if you think about the long-term evolution of them. Because uh, what is the, the net annual input of mass on the surface versus the melt? That controls whether they recede or advance. So I use the, the, the global climate model with these boundary conditions to produce maps of um, snowfall, snowmelt, and, the, and the, the net balance. We've actually discussed this episode in the class, and during this time, part of Pennsylvania was covered with ice. But I'm curious, were you able to um, adequately model the ice sheet? Yes. The, w these um, amounts of snowfall and snowmelt are quite reasonable uh, from what we can deduce about what they should be at the glass glacial maximum, which is actually, since the ice sheets were at their maximum, they weren't rapidly receding or growing, the net input of mass should be close to zero. Uh, and that it, it, that's how it works out in these, in these um, simulations. Mm -hmm.